we're talking about psychoeducational assessments with Dr. Michelle Cozy Hayes. She is a registered psychologist who runs a private practice and is at BC Children's Hospital. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Hi, Catherine. Thanks for having me today. Thanks for agreeing to come on. And just to clarify, I am a member of a group practice and I have some of my own solo practice on the side as well as an, a member of the Department of Psychology at BC Children's. Wonderful. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right, so why don't you give us a little bit more information about what it is exactly that you do? So I'm a registered psychologist, which means I have a PhD and a lot of supervised clinical training uh, at the doctoral and the master's level. And I'm also been uh, evaluated by and confirmed by the BC College of Psychologists as meeting their requirements for independent practice in the province of British Columbia as a psychologist. My training and background is in school psychology as well as other aspects of clinical service. And so that's kind of my background. And I work with children, uh, youth, and sometimes university students but most importantly with parents and educators and the caregivers and support service professionals who help grow children up. Let's start out by talking about what exactly a psychoeducational assessment is. Many people in the field of both psychology as well as education and other what we call allied health disciplines provide different types of assessments. So with very young children, we might do what's called the developmental or screening assessment. Sometimes when school-aged and older children have difficulties with learning, we provide psychoeducational assessments. And there are other assessments such as diagnostic assessments of a particular condition or exceptionality, such as autism assessments, or alternatively mental health assessments, which are more focused on emotional health and well-being. Psychoed assessments largely focus on children's cognitive development and their academic progress and their learning and factors that impact a child's success at school. What type of student would need a psychoeducational assessment? Students often come to us with a very wide range of needs that warrant psychoeducational assessment and it could be difficulties with learning uh, in general, uh, learning to read, writing, mathematics, sometimes other issues related to motivation. Typically, we want to be looking at assessments because they're fairly in-depth and fairly comprehensive at students who are struggling academically despite having received quality initial inter interventions at school. Can this happen like when a kid's in kindergarten or what about if you're a university student struggling? Is it appropriate to get one done then? That's a really complicated question. It might vary depending upon the child or the student. So generally speaking, uh, we don't necessarily want to put children who are just getting used to sitting in a desk, learning how to self-regulate to attend school, and they haven't maybe had very much exposure to the curriculum necessarily through a very comprehensive assessment at a very young age. At that point, what we may be assessing are those factors which are, are they ready to learn? How much exposure to the curriculum have they had? How much enrichment have they had prior to attending school? That said, in some cases, we do have families where there's a very strong history of learning exceptionalities. And sometimes despite earlier intervention, even prior to going to school, there may be early signs or early indicators that we may initially do a consultation, possibly an assessment with younger children. Uh, typically, what we're looking for is children, as I said, who are struggling despite having received some quality intervention or sometimes just a little extra help initially to make sure that they're caught up and it's not due to other factors. Less often we see kids who are in university for the very first time, but we often see students in high school and in university as part of preparation for learning plans and support programs in post-secondary or updates of their post-secondary support plans. Right, so would that be because of how frequently they're expected to be done? Like, is this something that needs to happen on a regular basis or are there just a couple times throughout an uh, individual's education that they should have this done? So I think you can look at that as you're sort of weighing two things. If you're kind of putting out your left hand and then putting out your right hand and you're trying to keep a balance, 
between the fact that children do grow and change. There's a very common phrase in the field of education and psychology that assessments tend to be a brief snapshot of children in time at one point in their development. So as they grow, as they learn, and if they've had additional supports, their academic functioning may change and their learning style may change as well. So in that sense, the assessments and some of the recommendations as children mature can become what we call dated and not necessarily relevant to a child's learning and educational plan many years down the road. On the other hand, we don't necessarily want to put children and families and teachers through unnecessary assessments that are really going to be repeated after short intervals just based upon some six number. We often recommend to families and to schools that there should be a thoughtful reason to reconduct uh, an assessment, which is, has it been a very long period of time with a long period of growth? Are there changes in the child's functioning? And the really big important one is, is there a transitional period or phase that the child is going through that warrants an updated understanding of the child and updated planning for their support services? So that example would be transitioning from grade seven to grade eight, from elementary school to high school. Often, if they haven't had an assessment done in a while, they've transitioned to high school, and there's need for accommodations on exams in high school. And also very often, we see students who have not had an assessment during the high school period, and who that young person is as a young adult now, nearing either the end of grade 11 or some point during grade 12, they're preparing to plan for their post-secondary career as an adult, but the last time they were assessed, they might have been an elementary school child. In cases like that, having a current understanding of the child to plan for this big sort of life stage transition or shift is very important. Right, and most uh, post-secondary institutions require that the psychoeducational assessment is no older than two years at the time of graduation uh, in order for them to provide the accommodations. With that, what we always encourage educators and school-based teams and families and students to do is they should very, 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 I can't say very enough, connect with possible institutions where they are looking to attend and find out what their policy is. In some cases, it's five years. In some cases, it's two years. Uh, and it's very important to plan for that in advance because the wait list for either school district-based reassessments or even private assessments often can be months to sometimes years. What's the difference between a school-based psychoeducational assessment and a privately done one? Both of these types of psychoeducational assessments are geared toward having a better understanding of the child and how to help a student succeed uh, at a higher level. Typically within schools, the individuals conducting the assessments are school psychologists who often, but not always, are master's level trained clinicians who have significant experience in working within schools, school districts, and with teaching staff. The primary referral question for school-based assessments often is, is this child eligible for special education services? And as a consequence, that frequently tends to be the focus of uh, school-based psychoeds. But at the same time, when resources permit, many school psychologists will attempt to provide a more comprehensive picture, such as screening a child's social emotional development and looking at other factors that may influence a child's learning. Usually when you are provided with a school-based assessment, the child is identified by what's called the school-based team. So a school-based team usually involves uh, teachers, resource or special education teachers, sometimes also called uh, learning support teachers, LST, or integration support teachers, IST, uh, caseload managers, and sometimes someone from the administration at the school, such as a vice principal or principal, and as well other district level staff who may come in from the district to consult with a school-based team, such as occupational therapists, speech therapists, and district level uh, school psychologists. They review school concerns and the child's functioning at school 
and determine whether at this point the child has received adequate intervention or there's some query about very specialized needs. And at that point, a decision is made with the input of the parents to put the child on the district list for a school-based district assessment. So there's a whole process involved that involves more than just the student, the classroom teacher, and the parent. So you've got a team involved, which is also a nice aspect of that. In contrast, private assessments are conducted typically by a registered psychologist in private practice, or sometimes individuals at a master's level under the supervision of a registered psychologist in private practice. And in those cases, the referral question is slightly different. Usually it is parents or caregivers who are presenting who may have a number of questions that go beyond the scope of, for instance, a school-based assessment in addition to the learning needs such as does my child have anxiety and is that influencing um, their learning process and does that need to be a consideration and do I need to go for further mental health assessment. So in that case, uh, the parent or the caregivers typically are more the driver of the assessment process and the registered psychologist works with the student and the family and secondarily with the school based team as well, hopefully educational assessments cost so much like is it really that much more of an in-depth process I think there's a number of reasons for that uh, number one typically the services that are being requested are being requested by a select type of professional which is usually licensed registered psychologists so the people who are conducting those services in order to be able to provide those services in private practice have had to go to school anywhere from five to seven years longer than the typical master's level clinicians. And they've also had to go through the registration process and maintain that licensure on an annual basis. Okay, so there's a difference in that level, although that said, as I mentioned before, there are many school psychologists with fantastic qualifications, knowledge and abilities, and lots of wisdom and expertise in working in the school systems. So there is that difference, generally speaking, though, about uh, level of practice. The second thing is that the more comprehensive nature that is often done in private assessments, because parents may have additional questions that go over and beyond the school uh, referral scope. Right, and like, does it have to do with how much you know, actually administering the test take and how much time is invested into the whole uh, process of going through the psychoeducational assessment? Like, is that different from private and school-based assessments? I think one of the factors that I really respectfully want to comment on, because a number of the people who are school psychologists that I work with and have worked with in the past are very competent, well-trained people, but one of the practical restrictions on their practice is that they have very heavy caseloads and long wait lists and they're responsible for getting through as many of those students and serving them as much as possible. As a consequence, the resources that are provided to the school and the special education system do restrict the amount of time to a degree that they are allowed to spend on any given student because they can only provide so many hours within any given school year. The contrast to that is that individuals in private practice have more luxury over how many assessments they take on, and more importantly, how long they spend on any given assessment. And that's just really, frankly, a privilege of being able to offer private assessments that we don't necessarily have that same time constraint. Yeah, and that can uh, give a big difference between looking at a assessment done through the school system where the, the time is a factor and the number of uh, tests they're able to administer is a factor whereas when you get a psychoeducational assessment done privately the professional can be more discretionary about their time and often have a bigger repertoire of tests they can draw on to use during the, the process that can give you um, more detailed information. And um, whereas the school-based psychologists 
are typically trying to get that designation and the services provided, but don't have the luxury of time to put more into the assessment, going it deeper into different skill areas. Would you say that's the correct assessment or statement? I think it probably varies a lot uh, based upon caseloads and district. Uh, generally speaking, a lot of that is sort of a correct characterization. But again, it can be a function of district uh, special education leadership, the different roles that school psychologists are in, and how long the caseload is. Right, yeah, that's, that's you know, very true. I, I kind of say to a lot of friends and colleagues, but as well as people that I work for and work with, that I, in some senses, wish that I didn't have to do this job privately, even though I love it, because it would be a real benefit to families and students if we had a more comprehensive practice within the schools and there wasn't such a demand for private services. Uh, but unfortunately at, that time, at this time, whether it's autism assessments or whether it's psychoeducational assessments within school districts, there hasn't historically been adequate funding to provide the level of services that we would like for students and families to receive publicly. Now, when you go into writing a psychoeducational assessment report, what goes into that and what can parents and educators hope to learn from reviewing that report? Ideally, any psychoed assessment is to help, whether it's parents, caregivers, but the educators as well, to gain a more comprehensive or wider understanding of a child's development in ways that they learn best and what are specific things potentially that that student needs such as accommodations differentiation remedial instruction in order for that child to succeed academically if, if, if i'm looking at a psych ed report why do they give the you know the background information and the description of the tests that were used before they talk about the findings well i think different reports are structured in different ways um, can you tell me a little bit more what, by what you mean by that question? Well, uh, typically they give a history of like whether the child was full term, um, what type of childhood they had, their previous education, and then it goes into what tests were done during the assessment before it discusses the findings. In cases like that, when the reports are structured that way, the goal is for everyone reading the report to really be able to understand, but more importantly, acknowledge the context in which a child's development and learning has occurred. So scores tell you at what level a child perhaps is achieving or progressing. They don't necessarily tell you how or why they got there, and they don't necessarily tell you how or why a child learns best. But that said, things like, did your child attend preschool? Did your child go through a lot of moves? Did they have to switch schools many times? Was there marital separation? Has there been family stress? Have there been medical factors? It's really important to acknowledge the impact of those things on a child's development and their ability to be ready to learn and to take full um, advantage of learning opportunities provided to them. Many families and children have had factors that influence their ability to participate in the educational programs. And it's really important to both respect, but also acknowledge that that is an important factor in a child's learning. Now, also in their reports, they come with these different scores, like percentiles and standard scores. What exactly do those mean? Think of it this way. Um, there are many different metric systems or measurement systems in which we can measure things. So we think about the actual metric system, we think about imperial measurement. We think about some of our old fashioned historical, like how many hands tall is a horse, how many stone in weight. But when we're talking about how heavy something is, if you kind of put out your hands and get a sense of a certain amount of weight, whether you call it so many stones, so many pounds, so many kilograms, they really boil down to how heavy something is. So what all these different scores do is to find a common language in order for us to be able to kind of understand a child's performance. 
And just the same way you can translate kilograms into pounds and pounds into kilograms, it's important to know that many of these scores are interchangeable in different ways. That said, what we typically do when we're assessing ch children and students on what's called standardized tests is we don't expect a child in kindergarten to achieve the same number of correct items or answers as we do a child in grade 12. We really want to know how are they doing for their age compared to other boys and girls at their age. So for a kindergarten child, getting six right might be meaningful or not meaningful. Maybe on a task that has many, many questions for a grade 12 child, getting six right would be meaningful because it's not a lot compared for their age. What we do is we take those total number of correct or incorrect answers that a child is struggling with or succeeding with, and we compare them to the average performance for other students at their age. So all of these scores give us a benchmark. What is a child's development like compared to other children at that age? Is it average, below average, above average, high average, low average, well above average, all these different areas, we can kind of map their score for their age onto what's called the bell curve. Right, and then we use where that score lies to figure out if they meet the diagnostic criteria for different um, disabilities or disorders. Scores should be considered only one part of any what we call diagnostic um, determination about children. Um, ideally, any assessment of a child, scores should be only one part, or scores from formal tests, so to speak, should only be one part of a larger decision making. So for example, many students can achieve the same score for their age, on a measure, but for very different reasons. We might have a child who can focus very well when given a lot of time and they can put in a lot of very hard work. They might struggle and endeavor and they're able to achieve a certain level of achievement. In contrast, we might have another child who winds up with the same score, who answers very quickly and is distracted and rushes. So in that sense, the scores are only one piece of the larger puzzle that goes into that kind of decision making. Other things are, are equally important in addition to sort of clinical observations is the overall pattern of scores in context of that child's history. So in fact, in many psychoeducation reports, you'll see a little disclaimer that says, test scores should not be treated or read or interpreted in isolation, but must be taken in context of the other findings and the overall picture of a child's development. Right, yeah, and it's definitely important to look at the whole child and just instead of looking at just one aspect when it comes to any diagnoses. For sure, and so the, all those sort of background things that you were asking about why do they include them, like were they full term, have there been any medical issues, that's really important again to go back to that issue, which is have there been other factors that have influenced that child's development and learning. I think also in that regard, um, when you think about kids, sometimes what's been going on for them in many different um, aspects of their life or the past couple of years can be really, really relevant. You know, how have they been doing socially? How are things going on at home? What kind of quality instruction have they had? Did they switch from English to French immersion or vice versa? Um, did they switch school districts? What did their performance look like in session compared to uh, what we call work samples of their actual work at school? So one of the things that I really try to do is to connect with teachers, resource teachers, uh, and have parents bring in a lot of samples in addition to report cards so I can see what is a child doing out of school and is their performance and just their numbers as well as what I'm seeing qualitatively does that match up with what's going on outside of a clinic room? Some kids find coming in for psychoed assessments initially a little bit nerve wracking or a little bit anxiety provoking, but we're actually trained to sort of detect that, to help put a child at ease and to help them be comfortable to process and see this as sort of an educational experience where they're learning about their own learning and their own brains and their own development. 
But that said, it really is important to see if our sort of more formal data inside the assessment matches the child's development outside of the assessment. Right. So saying that, what should a parent do to help prepare their child for a psychoeducational assessment? There are a number of things, and there's been some advice that I historically and traditionally have given to parents over the years. And the first thing that I would recommend is that they help their child sort of intellectually understand that it is more of a developmentally common or typical or normal process to participate in. So I'll often use the analogy of a checkup. So I'll have the parents or I will talk to the child ahead of time with the parents and say, you know how we go for a glasses checkup or a hearing check or we go to the pediatrician or the doctor to see how tall you're growing uh, or how much you weigh. This is something we do as part of growing children up and as growing up their development. Something weird or unusual or there's something wrong with them because occasionally children do kind of get that sense, particularly if we as parents or caregivers are maybe a bit worried about our child's development and progress. Um, so the idea is to kind of make this as a developmentally typical process to participate in, such as a school checkup. And in fact, a lot of kids go for school checkups, uh, sometimes at school with the school psychologist and other times privately with someone else. The other thing that I try to have parents do a little bit is kind of match make the clinician uh, to the child a little bit ahead of time so that the child has a sense of being familiar with and being comfortable with the psychologist before meeting them. So I'll often recommend to parents if I'm having an initial meeting by Zoom that we say hello, we wave at each other, that we look at the website, uh, we talk about things that psychologists and I may have in common. So they just have a little sense of familiarity and a little sense of connection and not sort of a strange person in a strange place doing strange things. The last thing that I would do personally, although this practice varies across different psychologists, is I would have them describe for the child what the process looks like. And the idea is, am I going into like a medical room or am I going into a place that looks a little more like a dining room or an office or a workspace? And then who's going to be there? Is mom and dad allowed to be in the room with me or grandma or grandpa initially? Uh, similarly. How long do I have to work for? What kind of activities am I going to do? Uh, are the activities going to be really hard? And we sort of describe that just so the children can kind of get what I call a mental YouTube video of what it's going to look like. And it really helps to take away some of that anxiety or some of those imaginative worries ahead of time. Wonderful. I think that's great advice. Thank you so much for coming on with me today, Dr. Michelle. And I think a lot of parents are going to benefit from this conversation. Well, thanks so much for having me. And I want to thank you for working so much with not only parents and students, but also educators and other people in the field to advocate for families. Um, we all have a role to play in helping kids learn and helping them succeed.